Well, hello there, Game of Thrones fans. Welcome to another channeling of frustration into art. You've already seen me tear apart the bad half of Game of Thrones, so I thought it was time to take a look and see if the good half is as great as we like to remember it. As the runtime of this video already suggests, yes it is, and that's covering all four of the good seasons, but being the bona fide hater that I am, nothing gets past my troll eyes. Like, comment and subscribe if you like what you see, this is Every Error in Game of Thrones seasons 1, 2, 3 and 4. When wheel reports of how an entire wildling encampment, men, women and children all, was brutally slain, his colleague's response is complete and utter nonsense. They even killed the children. It's a good thing we're not children. Alrighty then. A strange change from the books comes in episode 2 in the addition of Cersei's black-haired beauty, a child supposedly conceived by King Robert, not Jaime. I lost my first boy, little black-haired beauty. I never knew. Now this child's existence is only ever acknowledged in this one scene. A royal pregnancy, especially a first, would be the talk of the town, between best friends nevertheless. Not to mention it being one of the cornerstone traumas that makes Cersei wake up every morning and choose violence. I came to take his body away. And Robert held me. I screamed and I battled, but he held me. The boy looked just like him. Stranger still is that the child isn't mentioned later on in the lineages and histories of the great houses of Westeros that Ned picks up when investigating John Arryn's death. Forgive me. It's the last thing you need to hear right now. And if this is just Cersei being cruel and messing with Catelyn, no suggestion as to that is ever given, nor does this information ever come back to cause any misunderstandings or controversies. And that's it for season one. Nothing more. Nice. It is that good. Then in season two, at the gates of Karth, Daenerys and her people face certain death as... If you do not let us in, all of us will die. Unless she does the radical thing of simply showing off her dragons a little bit. Might we see the dragons? But instead of complying with this modest request, she threatens to burn the city to the ground. When my dragons are grown, we will take back what was stolen from me and destroy those who have wronged me. Someday. A threat she won't be able to realize if she is turned away indeed. Only, as you said a moment ago, if we don't let you into the city, you will all die. Later, Stannis and Melisandre use a one-hit shadow assassin to kill Renly, but despite this being insanely efficient, completely overpowered, and at seemingly no expense, it's not possible to do this over and over again because... Make me another son. I cannot. Why? You don't have the strength. It would kill you. Okay, so in the books, it's actually explained that the creation of the Shadow Demon Assassin drains Stannis' life force, and we see this as Stannis sleeps less, looks radically older and appears exhausted after the demon is made. But in the show, no such signs are added, and the reason they don't simply copy-paste this tactic until the world is theirs becomes pretty contrived in comparison. Your fires burn low, my king. Emotional damage! In the books, Quaith is only ever seen by Daenerys, which begs the question whether she's even a real person or some kind of vision. What we do see in the show, however, even hints at her being a faceless man. Who are you? I'm no one. And she warns Jorah about the perils Daenerys is about to face, which isn't the problem in and of itself, but if she is indeed a faceless man, it doesn't make sense for her to support a Targaryen out of the blue, seeing as the Targs were part of the ruling class of Valyria that the first faceless men rebelled against once upon a time. And if Quaith is a vision sent by someone else, then how and why? Is this the doing of the Three-Eyed Raven? Or some sorcerer burning the parts of little boys? In my opinion, Quaith could have been a neat little device to expand on Daenerys' eventual descent into madness, provided she was an illusion that Danny kept to herself. This would have provided some semblance of build-up to her making herself the Queen of the Ashes. Stick around for the upcoming video series on fixing Game of Thrones, where we delve into such potential improvements. When Jorah says, Moving carefully is the hard way, but it's the right way. Daenerys responds with, And if I'd listened to that advice outside the gates of Karth, we'd all be dead by now. But this advice was never given at the gates of Karth. And the reason they're still alive is by no means thanks to Daenerys' masterclass in diplomacy, <laughs> but rather to lucking out with Zara thinking she's hot and vouching for her. Basically, all the choreography in this fight. <laughs> Uh, 
Corrin and the other Night's Watchmen leave John to execute a captive wildling alone to no apparent benefit. It could be speculated that this was a deliberate way to test John's guts, or even Corrin counting on the extremely unlikely scenario of John sparing Egret's life and then join and infiltrate the wildlings. There's also the far-fetched idea that Corrin might want to see John captured by the wildlings in order to garner sympathy from the Lord of Winterfell, who might send men and supplies to the Watch, so that they might rescue John as well as Benjen, who is also lost beyond the wall at this point. But again, there's nothing concrete in the show to support these theories, making them little more than vague speculation. Also, they tell John to meet them at the top. We'll meet you at the top. So shouldn't they be able to see Egret escaping and try to do something about it? Regardless, Egret escapes, and that's where John jumps through a wormhole to intercept her. At Harrenhal, Arya takes the life-threatening risk of carrying off a letter from Tywin to read it, instead of just reading it on the table where it was. Also, when Amory Lorch gets his hand on the letter and brings it back up to Tywin, he is swiftly taken out by Jacken in all fairness, but the letter is still in his possession, which ought to raise a question or two. But the letter, and how it wound up in the hands of Lorch, is quickly forgotten about. Over in Winterfell, Osha, who at this point has been forced back into Theon's service, sneaks out of the castle, but she doesn't eliminate Theon while she has the chance, even though that would have been a safer way to escape, leaving their pursuers leaderless and in disarray. After having already captured Corn Halfhand and decided not to kill Jon on the spot, the wildlings put the two prisoners right next to each other for no apparent reason, instead of keeping them at a safe distance from one another, which of course allows them to conspire. Man's just gonna march on the wall. When it does, one brother inside his army be worth a thousand fighting against it. They'll never trust me. They might, if you do what needs to be done. As Stannis lands at the mud gate for the invasion of King's Landing, he not only spearheads the charge without shield or helmet himself, but not a single archer on the wall targets him specifically, something which, of course, could end the rebellion right there on the spot. Stannis is then, again, first up the ladder, still no shield or helmet, mind you, the stones and arrows conveniently nowhere near him, and he's allowed to waltz right over the walls, virtually uncontested. And he remains on the walls all the way up until Tywin's forces swoop in to save the day, but without finding Stannis and totally letting him get away somehow. Stannis, fight! Stannis, fight! No! No! Remember how Winterfell was surrounded by northern forces? I want you to know you're surrounded. I know I'm surrounded. With no sleep and nowhere to run, the Ironborn decide to pack up and leave and do so successfully. Let's go home. Also, when Bran and gang leave the next day, no northern forces have entered Winterfell and none are surrounding it anymore. Where did they all go? Okay, this is a bit silly, but when the Lord of Bones cuts Jon's bounds, it rings like steel on steel. Hardly worth mentioning, but kind of ridiculous at the same time. When Daenerys comes for her betrayer Zaro, not only are there no guards protecting the King of Cards, but Blood Rider Kvaro magically snatches Zaro's necklace without either breaking it or jerking Zaro's head significantly. What the, the warlocks of Karth attempt to murder Daenerys with a scorpion. No, not those, the animal. Showing their intent not to let her slip away, only that's exactly what they do and are never seen or heard of again. As Bran and gang are resting up, Osha suddenly looks at absolutely nothing and stops what she's doing because... We don't know who might be after us. No one even knows we're alive. Shut up and move, I guess. When Miro, the leader of the Second Sons, grabs at Missande, she reacts as if this were unusual behavior, as if this wasn't her everyday life for the last few years. A more realistic reaction might have been to descend without looking so surprised, which is exactly what she does when he smacks her on the bum a minute later. When Arya and the Hound chance upon some Frey soldiers hanging out in the woods, Arya rocks up to get some vengeance, and right after she shivs one of them, the Hound teleports in to take out the rest by surprise. And in the very next scene, we've got Jon Snow, who just escaped the wildlings by riding off on a horse, now with a target on his back, as Egret has teleported in, completely horseless, to relate to Jon just about the extent of his knowledge. You know nothing, Jon Snow. How did you get there so fast? Not important, I guess. When the former slaves of Astapor come out to receive Daenerys, Miss Sande says they all owe their freedom to the Mother of Dragons, but Daenerys wrongfully corrects her and says, 
Dervi Jerry si di Belos da or. Lo miri ziri. Mes malgon bestila. This doesn't make sense, seeing as they've already been liberated. By her. However, in the case that she's talking about a more philosophical or spiritual freedom, then Missandei is still not wrong for attributing their worldly liberation to Daenerys. This may seem like a trivial point, but it's a vital sign of deteriorating writing, which stands in stark contrast to the exceptional quality of that in early season 3. When Jaime first starts training with Bronn, he brings a Valyrian steel sword to practice with, as if that were appropriate for sparring. Problem is, if you fight with an edge blade, I'll have to. And if I fight with an edge blade, I'll have no one left to pay me. After Dario Naharis slays the champion of Marine, Daenerys addresses the city, but she's so far away that there's no chance in Seven Hells anyone could possibly hear what she's saying, and yet it's made out as if they all do. When Jon is training recruits at the wall, he sets Locke against some poor fool who immediately gets knocked out cold. No one comes to help him. Worse, after training is done, they just leave the poor guy on the ground to fend off the brain damage all on his own. Can't afford to lose a single man. When Bran and Gang come upon Craster's Keep and see the mutineers from the Night's Watch, Mira, who has no experience of the Night's Watch, somehow correctly points out that... It might have been Night's Watch once, not anymore. Just how would she know that? She then breaks from hiding while speaking loudly and without checking where she's going whatsoever, which of course results in her getting Hollywood knocked out by the mutineers, who conveniently knew where to find and surround them all along. Then, when John and his task force approach the keep, they actually make sure to scout the area before engaging. Eleven men, most of them already drunk, no guards posted, they don't seem to have a care in the world. But when they finally do attack, they may as well have been a horde of Dothraki the way they scream and shout without a sense of stealth to speak of. And then when Carl, who... I haven't lost a fight since I was nine. I was a f***ing legend, Jinami. A f***ing legend! When Carl, the f***ing legend, knocks John to the ground and gets stabbed in the back by one of Craster's wives, he turns his attention towards her, completely neglecting John, who obviously comes back to kill him. So much for the top paid cutthroat and flea bottom, I guess. At the small council meeting, on the topic of Daenerys with her 8,000 Unsullied and three dragons, Tywin says something quite a bit out of character. Dragons haven't won a war in 300 years. Armies win them all the time. We both know you're smarter than that. After the Hound is sneak attacked by Biter and miraculously snaps his neck when one fell swoop, Arya casually walks up to Rorsch, draws her sword and stabs him to death before he can even react. Even though his sword is already in his hand. The wildling attack on the wall contains a few errors, starting with Egret's Matrix dodge. I could be missing something here, but these empty barrels blowing people up? Then John has his head smashed into an anvil, but recovers immediately. In general, it's unlikely that the wildlings wouldn't have sent any climbers up the wall beforehand to run along and take defenders to top the wall of Castle Black unawares. As you can tell, the numbers speak for themselves. Yes, it gets a bit nitpicky at times, and it's not for a lack of trying to find substantial errors here. I've tried as hard as ever, and this is it. Do let me know if you think I missed something, but remember, changes from the books are not necessarily errors, just different creative choices. I don't think anyone has a problem with Arya and Tywin and Harrenhal, for example. This concludes the Every Error series for Game of Thrones. Next up is a big video series on fixing Game of Thrones, where we go all the way back to where the creative choices stop making sense to the trajectory of the narrative. And, as the title suggests, fixing it. Look forward to that and don't forget to click all the buttons to get all the notifications and help all the channels grow and I'll see you again in another video.